Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I'm Matt Garrisimovich, a PhD student in Russian lit. This week, the books on my desk continue to pile up so far. Soon I will be trapped inside. <laughs> And I'm Cameron Lalana. In the spirit of this book being about immigration from Russia, I, uh, while visiting some friends in San Francisco, happened by a Russian grocery store and picked up the supplies for Buterbrot. And I don't normally eat meat, but I crave Dr. Skaya Kolbasa so, so deeply. So uh, that's my, if, there's sound like, if it sounds like there are crumbs in my mouth, there are. I'm eating Buterbrot on the side. I could hear them from across the country. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is a podcast where me and my good pal Cameron get to unwind from our week with some Russian literature and a drink or kielbasa or two. Uh, this week, we're going to be taking a crack at Ludmila Ulitskaya's The Funeral Party. This book was originally requested by a few of our patrons who indicated that they would like us to cover more modern Russian literature. For as little as $3 a month, you can keep your favorite Russian literature podcast running and join in on fun events like movie nights on Discord and this upcoming weekend, keep an eye out for our Mermaid movie night, which you may have already heard about in other releases or our Discord if you're in there. If you're not interested in Patreon but still want to help us out, you can leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts or sign up for our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com, which, by the way, has recently gotten a very nice redesign from our very own Matt Garasimovich, and it looks excellent. You're welcome. As of recording the podcast, it's only halfway finished, so if you go on there now and it's finished... I've beaten the clock. (laughs) Well, thank you for the updates, Cameron. Of course. Well, before we get into the reading today, Matt, what are you drinking? Uh, Tonight, I am drinking, I'm re-drinking one of my favorite beers that I've had on the podcast already. I'm drinking a Purple Line from Smiley Brothers Brewing uh, here in Evanston. It's apparently, as I found out, a seasonal beer. I've never felt more betrayed in my life that I... (laughs) <laughs> had to had to go go there and get one of the the last batches because I was so so upset that I found that it was a seasonal beer and that I can't drink it all year long. Well, such is life. Such is life indeed. Suffering, just like this book. <laughs> <laughs> what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking uh, something which, when I saw initially, horrified me. But it's called uh, gummy worms, described hmm. as a chewy pale ale. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. It's called, uh, it's from New Glory Craft Brewery. It has a lot of gummy worms on the label, which horrified me. And so I thought, well, obviously I have to get this for the podcast. It is closer to an IPA than you'd expect for something that's called uh, a chewy pale ale, but it is, it's got a nice sweetness to it. So uh, I hate, I hate the name. I hate the description, but the beer itself, it's good. It's good. If you live in anywhere around where they sell uh, crap beers from Sacramento. I would recommend you get it. For the viewers, Cameron, we gotta know, is it chewy? What does chewy mean in this context? <laughs> I Okay, so on the back it says that they add uh, ad- aggressively dry hopped with citra and Amarillo hops for all those sweet candied pineapple and fruit notes reminiscent of our favorite gummy candies. I'm not gonna lie to you, I have no idea what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a vaguely sweet in the same way a Hefeweizen is sweet, but if you're looking for a, a, a um, like a apple fermented, if you're looking for a cider, buy a cider. If you're looking for an IPA, <laughs> buy fermented. the gummy worm <laughs> chewy pale ale. <laughs> well, terrifying drinks aside. Yes, let's get in to the funeral party. Before we get into it, I just want to say I am so happy we're covering this book because I first read this when I was an undergrad, and I like I read it all in the like the first day it was assigned, and it kind of has been my benchmark for understanding cultural relationships. I, I don't know, like reading this book, even before I like left the country to study in Russia, like really helped me to understand Russian identity and even tangentially American identity in a weird way and just identity in general. And I just really like this book a lot. So I'm happy we're covering it. Yeah, I'm happy that I stuck through it because I gotta be honest, on like the first 20 pages or so when I was reading it, I was like, I don't know if I like this book. <laughs> and then by the end, I was like, oh my God, I think I'm gonna cry. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. It was quite an emotional journey, I gotta say. Yeah, it is. This book is like, it's hard for us to cover because it's less of a narrative or a philosophical text like we usually cover and more of a vibe in a way. <laughs> <laughs> just, just Emmy Gray vibes, I guess. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. It's really cool, but literarily it's interesting too but we can talk about that a little bit later so i got a little bit of biography for those who do not know yes please Ludmila Ulitskaya. 
Uh, so I got just a couple biographical points. Nothing that I think necessarily impacts the book or your understanding of it, but just because seeing as though we haven't really done a bi- biography in a while because we've been covering a lot of the same uh, Tolstoy, I um, thought it might be a nice little refresher. So she was born in 1943 in the Republic of Bashkortostan. So it's that republic is kind of on the southwestern part of Russia, but it's interesting to note that it's, you know, it's a... I guess in the sense, it's a periphery in the sense that it's not Moscow or St. Petersburg for the sake of what we've mostly covered on the podcast. So it's a little bit, a little bit peripheral. That being said, she did end up, uh, you know, growing up in Moscow and ended up earning a degree in biology from Moscow State University. She, although unfortunately later in her life, lost her scientific credentials for distributing banned literature. Kind of cool. She then, after that, I mean, not the losing scientific credentials, but you know. Go ban lit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, following that, she began working at the Moscow Jewish Theater, where she worked as a playwright, doing adaptations, uh, children's plays, all sorts of stuff, uh, and began publishing her prose at the end of the 1980s. Not exactly um, the most calm period for Russia. Uh, she became famous in 1992 with... I, I don't know if this is her first work. This is the first one that I see credited on all of her biographies. She published Sonichka. Uh, which is translated as Sonichka. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> it was published in, in Novi Mir, uh, New World, which is Russia's basically kind of preeminent literary journal. Uh, so that's a big deal to get published there. And that's where she kind of started getting attention. So, so I have this quote from a biography kind of page that I was that I was looking at that I thought was um, kind of interesting based on everything I've been synthesizing. I think it does a, a good job of just giving a little bit of an overlay of the land. And the quote reads, Ulitskaya's elegant psychological prose often evokes the Russian realist tradition while centering on the lives of Russian women in the globalized and post-Soviet world. Now, not really that deep of a quote, necessarily pretty uh, surface level, but we will talk about kind of what all that means a little bit later. But that is my short and sweet biography of (laughs) several bullet points uh, about Lumila Ulitskaya. And like I said, uh, I, I don't think too much of it necessarily impacts this book but you know it's good to know judge judge for yourself i i think yeah she's she's a fascinating uh person i i'm also i will link in the description of this episode the article the weight of words by masha gessen which is an excellent overview of ulitskaya's life and intellectual influences which i think is just really interesting reading in general okay so on to the funeral party this is a hard book to summarize, and I, I tend to go along anyway, so I'm going to do my best to rein it in. The basic premise of the funeral party is that it centers around a group of Eastern European emigres. You could say Russian, and I used to, but after rereading, it really is more of a... It does center on Russian people, but it's not just a, about Russian people. It's about kind of the Eastern European experience in abroad but specifically in america and and uh, this group of eastern european emigres who are losing the person who kind of brought them all together alec the, the man who lived an artist who lived kind of a charmed life and brought all kinds of strange people together in uh, a land which he loved a lot and how they all re- react to that so i'm gonna i'm gonna give a basic overview of the book and then i'm gonna focus more so onto the characters because that's really the point of this book the, the characters and the way they exist in america and their reactions to his death in short the book is just alec dying it really is us joining a group of his friends as they are um sitting with alec as he is going through some kind of disease which has not been identified which is uh ravaging through his body and as one of the unlicensed doctors a a russian doctor who has never managed to achieve his license in america notes that eventually it will basically get, taking away his use the use of his muscles from him and eventually it will take away the use of his throat muscles preventing him from breathing so his time is very short and we see many people come into his life some brought in by circumstance by friends of alec who are trying to either heal him or comfort him in some way or old friends people who are brought in at the behest of old friends etc etc until as a side note, also, this is happening in the 1990s, so halfway through, the um, August coup happens, 
Which is when Soviet military generals tried to uh, remove Gorbachev from power, kind of the, towards the very, very end of the Soviet Union, which in a way also happens to bring all these people together, not just as friends of Alex, but uh, makes them all reflect on what it means to be citizens of this Soviet country, which is another big thing, theme of the book before Alec finally passes and they all have to deal with that. So it sounds like a relatively basic book and in less talented hands, it would be kind of uninteresting, but Ulitskaya really shines in the character work and in the people she brings to life. Obviously, we have Alec, the person I've been mentioning, who is an artist who has lived all over the world from all over the USSR to Rome to Spain to England now and through many years in New York, who's lived kind of a charmed life and has been a very interesting guy and, and pulls people together. We also have Nina, his wife, who is the daughter of a KGB colonel and a, a noted, noted, notably a great beauty, a model in her day, who seems to have um, a, a, a somewhat tenuous mental state, which plays into the book. Um, she's not, she's the only person really who doesn't have a solid like internal life. You really see Nina from the outside and her relationship to Alex which is very dependent. Although Nina is very, very religious, uh, a trait she's taken on in her later years, and a big part of the book is her trying to get Alec baptized before he dies, which has led leads to a comical scene in which, um, due to a an unfortunate scheduling error, the 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 priest she brings in and the rabbi that Alec requests to come see him both meet and they end up drinking together and talking philosophy after they both fail to convert Alec. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. We have Irina, another old flame of Alex who has done much better than Alex. She's come to America and she's become a lawyer and she's done quite well for herself. And she's raising a daughter, Maika, Maika translating to T-shirt in Russian, uh, who does, will not talk to any adults. She hates all adults except for Alec, who she finds charming. And he's the only person she'll talk to that is important. We'll also have people like Valentina, a Russian immigrant who tried to escape the USSR to the US after she, her, her attempt to become a, an academic didn't really work out. She tried to marry an American. Fortunately for her, he's very flaky. So she had a kind of a tenuous start before meeting Alec and, and Alec beginning a beginning to cheat on his wife, Nina, with her. Alec was also cheating on Nina with Irina, although Irina and him had a thing first and then they didn't and they did again. It he, he was at one point in the book, he thinks uh, I'll be an adulterer until I die. And that's um one of the many <laughs> very true lines of the book is just a. Uh, there's also that. That's a feature of his character, which is he's not an entirely positive character. He, he he is what he is. He's very elemental. And then we have a cast of of secondary characters. There's Fima, a Russian doctor who has never managed to master English enough to become a doctor in the U.S. Berman, another Russian doctor, a uh, kind of an acquaintance of Fima's, who has managed to become a doctor. And has actually been quite successful, but as the book jokingly points out, Berman is successful in $400,000 in debt, whereas FEMA is $400 in debt. You might assume the former is more uh, successful. And in fact, um, they live in the exact same way. One of the great jokes of the American experience. It's the American dream, baby. Yeah, exactly. Joining them is, is a great cast of people, uh, of Russians coming to, because they know them, who are coming to help them. Faika, who's a recent Russian immigrant. Ludmila, who's coming to help treat uh, Alec because she's a woman who's dealt with much suffering in her life. Uh, Maria Ignateva, who is there to provide Nina with cult with herbal remedies to Alec's condition. Father Victor, who is a the, the grandson of a Russian white officer. Rab Menasha, who is the rabbi who is brought by Irina's ex-husband to <laughs> help, help talk to Alec through his his dying days or alec himself is uh, ethnically jewish although he does not identify as jewish similar to ludmila ulitskaya herself and he only requests a rabbi to kind of poke fun at his wife trying to convert him before he dies but ends up quite liking the both of them in their own ways what makes this book fun is the interplay of all these characters oh uh, also gioia uh, uh, an italian woman who is there to learn russian and she just kind of hangs out with them i get that <laughs> uh, that's her role <laughs> But it's, it's their interplay of personalities to make this a really colorful novel uh, and really one that's really introspective in the way that they, they're interplaced. Because they're, they're all Russian immigrants, but they're not the same person. They have different relationships to their history. And that's what makes this book really interesting. I like that when you talk about it, trying to describe the characters, it kind of sounds like a friend trying to <laughs> describe their really extended family tree, um, which is kind of exactly what 
this book is. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> in a way. Yeah. So I, this is so I, I as I've alluded to earlier, I read this a long time ago, and I, I've read it a couple times since then. How did you walk away from it the first time? Well, as I mentioned, I did not like it at first. Uh, it took a little while for it to grow on me. Uh, I think it took a little while for me to figure out what was happening, which sounds dumb, but like, I don't know. It, it was kind of a new experience actually for me on the podcast because I think that most of the things we've read already read. There's mm. only been a handful of things that I haven't read and like prior to coming on here. So it's been really comfortable for me <laughs> all this time. Uh, sorry for you. Uh, but for me, it's <laughs> been fine. This one, I was like a little bit wobbly getting through. I read it really quick because I did end up getting like quite into it and yeah. I do have some thoughts on it. This is d- d- definitely, I don't know why I just get the impression that this would be better in Russian. And I don't mean, I don't want to say it to be like one of the pretentious people. Like, <laughs> uh, yes, I only read in language. Yeah. Um, but there's something about this that seems like it may capture the experience a little bit better. Uh, and I guess you could say that about everything. But it was just very interesting. And I thank you for making me finally read this. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I'm glad that you did. How was your your reread? It was good. It was after... Now that I've kind of gotten through the main themes that drew me in the first couple of times, I was really able to look at it as kind of a character study uh, in, in the face of, I don't know, identity. And looking at it not just as, like, through my personal lens, as, like, what does it mean to be russian abroad or what does it mean to be in ethnicity or nationality abroad looking at each of them and their own relationship to their history um especially now that for this podcast i did more background onto like ulitskaya's own history and and like a lot of this book deals with kind of jewish identity in a way that's very irreverent Mm -hmm. um and and when the first time i read it i kind of took it almost because i didn't know anything about ludmila ulitskaya i took that as kind of the uh, i don't want to say typical russian attitude but uh, kind of a common russian attitude towards judaism but knowing that she herself is an ethnic Jew who like has doesn't have a personal relationship to it, she's got like her own complicated relationship to Judaism. A lot of like the comp- complicated, irreverent relationship to Judaism in the book makes a lot more sense to me now, and I, I can see a lot more of, of I don't know the like the complications of identity, especially in the Soviet context and and coming out of the Soviet context means. And so I I really enjoyed seeing the nature of identity in it. Yeah, I think to me, what struck me finally when I, like I said, I was trying to figure out like what was happening. And then all of a sudden I realized like, oh, this is not so much a collection of stories as it is. It almost struck me as like a very ethnographic text in a way. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's literary, but it also has this almost ethnographic anthropological bent to parts of it. And I was like, no, that is really interesting uh, thinking about how it fits into the kind of themes of you're saying identity yeah what does it mean to be a russian abroad etc cetera, etc cetera. obviously that's kind of the primary thing people probably look at when they read this and that's kind of i mean i paid attention to that and then also like some you know some literature stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you did have some literary uh ideas to bring into it so i'm, I'm kind of curious what that was you mentioned it to me but I've, i'm not familiar with it yet pretty hot article i read it's okay. open access, so I don't lock myself out of it like I do with all my JSTOR <laughs> articles. Um, so I, I read this article from this Russian academic, uh, Dach Mamadova, and it's called The Paradoxes of the Space-Time Model. You know, I don't know if this is actually what I, I should look at it in Russian. Um, the English translation I'll be reading on the site says, Paradoxes of Space-Time Model Transformation, Specificity of Literary Time and Space Presentation in Lumila Ulitskaya's Prose. I, I, I think there's some extra words in there that I don't remember reading. Um, <laughs> but to, <laughs> to sum it up briefly, this article talks a lot, as you might imagine, about space and time and what it means in Ulitskaya's work, especially in, you know, the funeral party. That's what this is, what this article particularly is about. Though I might imagine that it applies to other things, because after I read this, I was like looking into more Ulitskaya stuff I want to read, and I was like, very interesting. Um, (laughs) But so this, to me, it's an ethnographic text, partially, um, but then on a literary level, this is what I was like trying to figure out. I was like, okay, it's, it's not really a story. It has a really short period of time in which the events actually take place but the flashback model i think seeks to put the reader in the seat of 
a Russian immigrant, is seeking to disorient you both in space and time. And there's a lot of really interesting things that happen as a result of the, this kind of model. And I mean, the whole book really deals with what it means to be not American, but at the same time, no longer Russian in the sense of like wanting to go back to Russia, um, which isn't specific, I don't think, to the Russian immigrant experience. It's probably a little bit more general, but it kind of continues on from there. There's kind of a, a couple lines that I kind of picked out that I liked. Mm. And I, I thought you were going to talk about it when you're talking about Alec at, at the end there, uh, where towards the end of the book, kind of when after he dies and people are reflecting on what he meant to them, uh, somebody reminisces saying he had built his Russia around him, a Russia which hadn't existed for a long time and perhaps never had. And just this apartment is such an interesting feature, the way that it, it brings people together in a way that probably no other period in time of Russian or Soviet literature would have. Just It's just a weird mix of people is the, the best way to describe it. And I think coming from reading 19th century and 20th century literature in Russia, for the most part, there's really a stratified or hierarchical, in some way, organization to society. And here you, you have people that don't fit into either society anymore. The only place they fit into is this one apartment. Yeah, I, I think that that is really well covered. And I wish I had written down this line. I've written down many ones, but not this one. Uh, in the way that it discusses the way they use the Russian language. Oh, here it is. The new American language came to them gradually in their new emigre milieu, milieu, and was also instrumental and primitive, and they expressed themselves in a terse, deliberately comical jargon, part English, part Russian, part Yiddish, which took in the most exotic criminal slang and the playful intonations of a Jewish anecdote. Like that liminal space between cultures really comes out in, in so many descriptions, but for me it was really best exemplified in the way they use their own language, which as they spend more and more time in New York, is falling further away from what it once was. It's not the kind of free-flowing, you know, just natural language, which is all around you, but it's something that just becomes purpose-driven. You're communicating with a lot of Russian immigrants who don't all speak the same Russian as you or speak more or less Russian than you or newer or older ones or the children of older ones. And it's, you know, it's, but at the same time, not, not it's contracting because it's less whole than it was, but it's also expanding in its own way. You know, it's gaining features of other languages as people with different backgrounds and languages come in to share their language with them in this new space. Yeah, it was kind of interesting for me to read because this is how my family emigrated earlier than this. Um, but they also emigrated to presumably the same area of New York um, because I, you know, little tidbits. It's too far away for me to claim <laughs> myself as, as Russian American, obviously. Yeah. But sometimes I can, sh there are like glimpses of maybe mentalities or just certain features that I was like, oh, you know, I recognize that. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that's where that came from, for instance, like certain like weird, weird things like that. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I think it's, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a, I don't want to say universal, but it's definitely widespread. I don't know. Some of the, just the, the feelings that I had while reading the book, I was like, huh, it's both specific and non-specific in a lot of areas, actually, I found. Yeah. I mean, it, it also does like very, very briefly cover other emigre experiences, as they point out that New York very much is a city of immigrants. There's like one somewhat comical scene. Uh, Alec is a great lover of art, but one one art he does not much like is the Paraguayan band that plays outside <laughs> his window when he's dying. And when he's very close to death, he, he tells one of the people in the apartment, please go tell him to shut up. And the guy goes down and he's gone for a little while. And then he comes back up with the whole band. <laughs> and he says, says to everyone, like, I, I invited him out for a drink. I thought I'd give him to stop playing if they're drinking. But turns out these are actually really cool guys. And then they just like set up in the apartment and start playing there. <laughs> and like everyone's like having a great time. And even Alec has um, kind of comes around on it. It's like, thing it is less of annoyance and rather as like an, a fitting theme for his death in a way. We kind of find out that they themselves are very, very recent immigrants of Paraguay. They are, oh gosh, I wish I ran it down, Guarani speakers. So they're like, it, it does touch on immigrants from other cultures. Like that, that's a big feature of it. One, one of the things that Ulitska does not shy away from is talking about, and racism is not a unique feature to Russian society at all. Um, however, uh, you, you, racism is a feature of Russian society as it is in many other societies. And so Lutska is not afraid to address that in her book. Like some of the main characters are, <laughs> I think she described, I can't remember which one it was. I think it's Fika. She describes her um, as Fika, who 
like many Russian immigrants, was, of course, a racist. Um, you know, that, that's something they're afraid of. And Alec, in, in his own way, pushes back on them and says, well, you know, like, they're really, you know, the, like, the, the diversity monk here is really a strength of America. He doesn't really, he doesn't say it in that way. He says it in a, in a very different way, in a way that I wouldn't repeat, because it's like, it's like watching Brat. I don't know if you've ever watched Brat Dva, and they try to say complimentary things about black people, but it, it's like, it's obviously complimentary, but it's said in a way that just makes you like, ooh, ooh, that, mm, don't say yeah. that. That's a, yeah. ooh, that's an awkward thing to say. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it does cover that. I think, I, I think Ulus guy is just kind of funny. There's definitely, a, <laughs> it's very comical, a lot of it. Yeah. Um, oh, it's very comical. <laughs> it's not always comical necessarily in the things that are happening, although yes it is but it's also kind of comical in just the way that it's it's phrased which here i I credit the translator because um to you know transfer the humor from one to the other is exceptional but yeah just some of the things that feel almost matter of fact offhanded and significant all at once just the kind of tiny details that she'll kind of pack in there i really enjoyed or just the intricacies of character like i i finished reading my reread of of, uh, this book on bart this morning and I was just like, it was like, <laughs> it's probably like 730 in the morning. And I was just like, kind of like trying to not laugh too loud. Uh, but like the, the scene where the, the, the priest arrives to talk to Alec and Alec is just there. He's requesting margaritas. So that he and the priest are drinking margaritas. <laughs> and then the, the rabbi shows up earlier than expected. And they're both kind of awkwardly like the rabbi is, why are you here? And the priest is like, I'm here to baptize this man. And the rabbi is like, well, I'm here to serve um, the lost child of Israel. What's what's happening here? And Alec kind of like leans over to one of his friends, or I think it's Valentina, and says like, make sure they keep talking and make sure they get drunk. <laughs> it's like, it's an incredibly comical scene as they get into... Like it's really interesting in the way that like Father Victor is a uh, the you know the grandson of a, a white uh, officer and he's got like a vague relationship to the fact that he's Russian but it's really not a feature of his life and Rob Menasha who Alec, of course Alec is himself Jewish uh, is is like supposed to be the ideal rabbi to bring he's like a really smart guy he's incredibly educated in and not only like modern Hebrew but also Spanish and Aramaic and Arabic and he's got all kinds of publications on like Spanish um, uh, Islamic theology and he just comes in and Alec I, I don't I don't I don't even think Alec really talks to him all that much he talks to them briefly and the the rabbi expresses his opinions on Alec's state as kind of like a as like an ethnically but not really culturally jewish person and then alec kind of pushes him into conversation with the priest and gets them both drunk um it's like it the way that ulitz guy is able to weave in genuinely interesting conversations about identity and then pushing into comedy and like a very way that doesn't feel like it, it doesn't feel like anyone's being made fun of it feels like the comedy of like you and your friends kind of like having sharing a little private joke about something you know some other relationship that you're seeing around you at a party or something it really is i don't know and the same way that you've described that it's like seeing a group of talking about the book is like describing a group of friends that's also kind of what reading it is like watching a group of friends turns out i do have actually a few more things to talk yeah, about go for it what do you want to talk about first love or comparisons to tolstoy let's talk about love we always got to end on comparisons to tolstoy okay yeah, so I was actually looking at a review from the Los Angeles Times that's just literally on the back of this paperback that I'm reading. And I was, well, because sometimes I read the back of my paperbacks every once in a while, <laughs> uh, like a maniac. And they had this one quote that I was thinking about as I was reading it. And I was like, is, did they read Did they read it? I don't know. Um, and it says, in America, we have friends, families, lovers, and parents. Four kinds of love. Could it really be that in Russia they have more? Well, this guy makes it seem so. And I was like, yes, but... But no, I think. <laughs> I don't know. I'm curious what you what you think about that quote. Because to me, my kind of, th- <laughs> my theory on this is, um, it's almost a sense of universal love in the novel, actually, mm-hmm. by the end of it. It's not a, it's not a delineated type of love. It's a very strange, almost, ending. I mean, okay. Do you mind if I go off on a tangent in my explanation? For my my it's fun. answer to your question? So I don't know the full context of the... LA Times line here but in a way that uh, like I think we've mentioned this before Alec is not just Alec he's almost representative of like a Russian identity like this vague Russianness which all people uh, who encounter him feel a connection to but that connection is very personal it's different for every person in his life that's also their relationship to Russia and I think there's no better moment in the novel and this is the moment which I like this this page has like haunted 
and bless my life for years because this has just been on my mind. I'm just going to read the whole paragraph. Uh, and I'm sorry that everyone has to sit through this, but like this, I just, I love this whole page so much. Like when I was on the flight to Russia, this was the page that I was thinking about. I'm scared. <laughs> And this is in my copy of The Funeral Party, page 90. All the people sitting there, and they're all watching the the coup, the August coup on TV. All the people sitting here who had been born in Russia differed in their gifts, their education, and human qualities, but they were united in the single act of leaving it. And then we follow to the next paragraph. As the years went by, even their bodies changed their composition. The molecules of the new world entered their blood and replaced everything old from home. Their reactions their behavior, and their way of thinking gradually altered. But the one thing that they still needed was some proof of the correctness of what they had done. The more complicated and insurmountable the difficulties they faced in America, the more necessary this proof was for them. Consciously or not, the news from Moscow about the growing stupidity, lack of talent, and criminality of life there during these years provided the proof that was needed. But none could have imagined that what was happening in that far-off place, which they had all but erased from their lives, would be so painful for them now. It turned out that this country sat in their souls, their guts, and that whatever they thought about it, and they all thought different things about it, their links with it were unbreakable. It was like some chemical reaction in the blood, something nauseating, bitter, and terrible. And that... (laughs) I don't even know how to talk about that because that that is such a visceral paragraph of the relationship to one to one's history. I mean, you could even like ex- extrapolate this to any context of you to your own history and the idea of national identity to history, especially in like the post-Soviet context. That's such an interesting thing. And that's why I, I kind of read Alec as like this, uh, I don't know, a fantasy Russia, a Russia that never was and never will be. Well, maybe maybe will be. Um and in a way that brings them all together, he's like this vague force, which they all have their own relationship to. And it's not an uncomplicated relationship to they in their own ways all kind of hate him. I mean, he's he's an unrepentant adulterer. There's Nina and Irina and Valentina and who knows who else. But the novel ends and Valentina and Nina are leaning on each other for support, even though they've hated each other for many years as people vying for Alex's attention. And it, it's it's not an uncomplicated relationship, but it is something that they are inexorably drawn towards, um, which I, I don't know is, is a feature of this book that I find super interesting because it, 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 there are many discussions about what that means, about what it means to be in Alex's life, about what it means to be Russian, and there's no there's no conclusion because there can't be a conclusion among tw- among ten different people. There are probably many ten different conclusions on that that subject, and that's what this novel reflects. They don't come to a conclusion on that. They all have their own relationship to it, which is what I love about it. Yeah, I think the the ending is, or towards the end at least, I guess it's kind of always towards the end because yeah. it's not that long of a book, nor it's that long of a time period that's covered, which continues to interest me. Uh, the article that I mentioned earlier talked about how the plot line is always kind of going there in the background. And I think once you get to maybe about like, halfway or so it starts to do the background of the women that Alec was involved with and it kind of forms these concentric circles as you go kind of further into the book and it almost forms this sort of time pendulum where you're going back and forth between two and it's gradually getting bigger and you're gradually starting to get uh, a, a bigger picture of what is happening but what's interesting because of the way that it's written that you're getting the individual memories of each of the women which is really actually cleverly constructed the more i think about it Mm. like i said i haven't had a lot of time to ruminate on this but the more i think about it the more excited i get about it um (laughs) i don't know why like the concept of time is so fascinating to me yeah um but it, it is especially for literature and so what's interesting about that is you don't get really any relationship between a lot of the women that are kind of sharing their stories i guess here until sort of when they're all together when alec is dying and so that's just kind of a to me i found that an interesting feature of this everyone is still kind of distanced as the story is going on at least from the narrator's perspective or i guess from the reader's perspective and they're only brought back together by his death yeah and and i don't know there's just so many we've already talked about this but in the way that his death is 
both tragic and comical, comical really comes together in so many forms of like, I don't know, his funeral in which they, they of course, they're his close friends, but they're also the many artistic friends and even some high up ones who <laughs> some of them are, are mad that uh, uh, Nina, Alex's wife, is upstaging them in, in fashion or um, <laughs> the, the the rabbis uh, or not the rabbis, the, the, the Orthodox uh, Jews who show up at the very end of the service because they got lost in the way. And everyone's like, I guess there's I think they're supposed to be here. Right. And everyone's like, yeah, they, that seems right. Um, of course, pointing uh, Lutzkel, as the narrator points out, that no one had actually invited them, but uh, Reb Menasha, the, the rabbi who Alec had talked about, had decided in the end that um, although he, they leave and he kind of tells them it's better for him to, to die as a, a non-believer, not as a, as a baptized man, he decides that he, it's it's up to him to kind of save Alec's soul. So they all kind of show up and give their last rites to him, and everyone's like, I think that's right, <laughs> before they <like>, tell him <laughs> like, hey, you want to come to the after party? And they're all like, well, no, we don't really, um, you know, as Jews, we don't really drink after. In, in mourning, but we will drink some vodka here, which I mean, I just like the relationship of drinking is also really interesting in this book. Everyone in this book drinks and it, like everyone has their own way of drinking. Like um, Father Victor, the the kind of Americanized pastor feels weird about drinking in Alex's presence and he reflects that as he's helping Alex drink his, vod- his uh, tequila, that he's helped dying people do many things, give confessions, uh, hearing their weaknesses, their strength, whatever, but he's never before given a dying man tequila. <laughs> <laughs> before Reb Menasha shows up and he's offered a drink and and you know he's like he turn, initially turns it down and he's like well actually do you have uh, vodka in um you know vodka in a paper cup and they do so he starts drinking vodka with the rest of them or um uh, something a really interesting line that uh I've been thinking about a lot um is something that uh, Alex says uh, this is during a flashback it's the climate Alec used to say there's no hard drinking in this country only alcoholism <laughs> And like the way that everyone relates their drinking is so interesting and like the like the um the religious uh Jewish people in the novel all have uh, not not ritualistic but like vod- the the drinking in in the Jewish tradition is very like it's it's straight up it's and and, and the idea of suffering in Jewish identity is brought up quite often and I don't know if that relates to drinking neat vodka but I think it could <laughs> cuz I don't know how else you'd describe drinking neat vodka and like the other ways that uh, other like there's a, there's a whole chapter about Nina's relationship to alcohol and how it changes when she comes to America and she becomes not a hard drinker, but she becomes a constant drinker. And like, I, I don't know, there, there's so many small details that Lutzka focuses on and, and how that relates to identity, which is so fascinating to like to read in, in terms of character identity. And also, I it's it's, it's kind of hard hitting because I, I made a joke to that about uh, to a friend of mine earlier today. And she was like looking at it. She was like, yeah, her background is, is she's Ukrainian. And she was like, yeah, that's kind of true. I not think about coming to America like that. That's, that's, that's how it happens. <laughs> so Ulis Kai was, I think, right on the nose with that one. Actually, her insights into American life are fascinating for somebody who, from what I read, hasn't spent, like, I know she has traveled to America, but yeah. she didn't ever emigrate, right? So some of the, the insights are just fascinating, like the line you read earlier about the man who's several thousand times more in debt than his friend, you know, them being equals and that kind of, you know, American sense that in a way being in more debt is better. Um, <laughs> there's just some real oddities that she picks up on that I think is fascinating that she was able to capture. Yeah, I, there's like a whole part where we reflect on Alex's relationship, but like Alex is Alex is kind of an Americanophile in a sense that he loves he loves New York, he loves being in America, and uh, he he spent time in in Russia, he spent time in Europe, he spent time in America, and he sees upsides to all of them, and he discusses them in a later chapter of like the the, the cultural subtleties of Europe versus the kind of broad shoulder elementalism in America, and uh, that's kind of a broad stroke, but this guy does have like some like you've said, really shockingly incisive work for, for a lot of places she hasn't actually lived in. Reading this book for me was was kind of a revelation because it kind of was an interesting view to see a really targeted and critical, but also like it, it felt well-researched or like well-lived kind of relationship to the American immigrant identity, um, which really draws me in and is really, really fascinating. I don't know. There's like this book is so many different things and there's like so many there's so many different things we haven't even touched on, which are just have their own little microcosm in just one chapter, like five to ten pages at maximum and are all interesting in their own way and in terms of identity or 
cultural criticism or whatever. It's, it's fascinating. I don't know. I, I just kind of love this book. It's fast. It's it's not terribly complex in a sense. And it's really, it sticks with you. It's, it's stuck with me through many years. You want me to read you my Tolstoy quote? Yeah, please. All you absolute fools thought <laughs> that I was going to be done. You thought I was going to be done talking about the labyrinth of plots. <laughs> Never shall I cease. <laughs> Uh, okay, so page 59 of my copy, I have this quote, which really struck me as a, a Tolstoyan quote. And you can't help but after reading Tolstoy, just finding his ideas and some of his thinkings absolutely everywhere. And I found it in a couple of places, but I, I like this one. I'll, I'll just read the paragraph because it was cool. It goes, Alex sprawled in his chair. Around him were his friends, shouting, laughing, and drinking. It was as though he wasn't there, yet they were all focused on him, and he felt this. He enjoyed the everydayness of life. Like a hunter, he had spent his life chasing after mirages of form and color, but now he knew there had been nothing better than these senseless parties where people were united by wine, friendship, and cheerfulness in the studio with no table, where they laid a makeshift tabletop on trestles. And so this appreciation of everyday life, obviously, has been a theme when we finished our summer of Anna Karenina. I, I found that in a lot of Tolstoy's works, this kind of sage older man i guess coming to this conclusion it has a like pretty direct parallel in well in that sense but then also the actual literal direct parallel of Ulitskaya writing about a man who's on his deathbed and people s surrounding him which sounds i guess as i'm saying it vaguer than it is but it's a it's a very direct parallel to the death of ivan Ilyich, which is probably tolstoy's most famous short story don't don't come knocking on my door if it's not actually i just said that off my <laughs> at the tip of my tongue that i was like is it maybe i don't know it's definitely up there haven't covered it on the podcast yet but we will we'll get there and just very briefly it's about a man who's dying and the people around him and his interaction with them but in that case it's <laughs> far worse of <laughs> and nobody cares about this man or people dislike him and you know they're just thinking about um oh i get to take his you know his position in society now that he's gone but you know i gotta make an appearance and so it's a much different you know the focus here is the death uh the focus in ulitskaya is the party you know it's can i cut in for a moment because that's extremely funny um no that's i'm done that's it Go ahead. okay that's good because Go as you say that this whole book everyone all the russian characters talk very very badly about russia and when alec is dying uh micah uh irina's daughter uh, asked uh, asks him was russia really that bad and alec says eh, not really everyone who's everyone who's intelligent about it is really just kind of dissembling lying about it they're coming with their own reasons for having come to this country um, and that's something that's extremely funny to me in relation to that story and that my, my hat in the ring for I understand Alec is an allegory almost for Russia. And it's kind of funny that a relationship to Russia, the country, Russia, the identity outside of Russia is both is complicated and it's hard, but it's ultimately nostalgic, which brings them all together in a way that the death of uh, Ivan does not for people who are still within the country. I don't know. This is just like kind of kind of a, fu a funny kind of parallel, which I, I can't imagine wasn't on Ulitskaya's mind, considering that she's definitely talked about, I've seen her talking about the death of Ivan Ilyich before. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that it's, I'm not saying she's just like ripping off Tolstoy here. Just that, like, I, I think it's important if you're reading Russian literature to be aware of the literary tradition, because people in Russia are aware of their literary tradition far more than in the US. And that's something that yeah. <laughs> Western readers aren't aware <laughs> of, or like, can't really comprehend how a writer who's writing has definitely read the same short story, this exact short story I'm talking about that like everybody else in Russia has read also. Um, it's just like an interesting kind of, I don't know, <laughs> national conscience, if you will. Yeah, I mean, that's even something that's addressed in the book and that, um, you know, Alec, who's a great lover of America, kind of complains that Americans have no great cultural tradition, which, I, you know, I, I think Americans have their own sort of cultural tradition. Um but I, I would never go so far as to say it's nearly as strong as a country like Russia's cultural tradition. Even even like the great um, great works of American culture, I would I would struggle to find many Americans who've read a lot of them. To be honest, yeah, I mean that's what he acknowledges, right? 
Yeah, if you, if you if you interviewed twenty people and asked them if they read Mark Twain, you're gonna find twenty liars. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, America! <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. This is just like such a fascinating book. It's so it's so close to my heart. It, it's just a, a really well done character piece, and has Lutz has an excellent eye for for contradictory and complex and overlapping and singular characters. And I really like it a lot. Yeah. Read it if you haven't. How about that? Think about it. Read it. Live it. Love it. I'm glad we I'm glad we covered this because like literally within the first couple of weeks of us starting this podcast, I bought almost all Ulitskaya's books that have been translated into English. <laughs> They've been on my shelf ever since. And I haven't read them yet, but I'm they're they're waiting there. They're waiting there. Yeah, somebody on Twitter when I said what should we read next, they said a woman to balance Tolstoy. <laughs> and I was like Good thing I've got something for you. <laughs> I would also like that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that has been an extremely ranging conversation on the funeral party. Indeed. But before we totally wrap up, Cameron, on a scale from one to Yeltsin, how drunk are you? Um. Well, I, I started drinking before we, we started this podcast because I was watching a band at a, or some friends of mine play at a, a beer garden and then I've had a couple tall boys since we started. So I'm I'm up there. I'm a good six. I'm a good six, as you might have imagined Ooh. by the, the very freeform associations I made in this episode. Uh, how, how about you? Probably about like a three because this beer is not very many percents and I was busy talking about space and time for most of this. That's fair. But I've had a good time. It's been a very good time. Well, uh, Matt, what are we reading in our next episode next episode we're reading heart of a dog by mikhail bulgakov this was another one that was suggested by patrons and just general everybody in our discord a lot of people (laughs) wanted us to read this one so we are gonna do it and if you're planning on reading along with us be sure to pick up your copy through our affiliate links on our website we earn a little bit of money from qualifying purchases and it is much appreciated before we let you go we wanted to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current patrons jeff janice Anne, emily jesse madeline alex daniel irini page darren larkin lou brandon allison gary cole daniel jack lucy alex and roland Podcasting isn't free and grad school doesn't pay very well. So if you're interested in joining with our current patrons to keep the show running, take a look at our Patreon at patreon.com slash tipsy Tolstoy. The music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also find us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast or join our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon. Bye.